morning, everybody. Um, just a quick introduction. Uh, pleased to have uh, General John Nicholson, our top commander in Afghanistan, here uh, in Washington, and uh, eager to provide you all an update on what's going on in Afghanistan. Without further ado, uh, General Nicholson, have some opening remarks, and then turn to your questions. Thanks, Peter. Okay. This is the Peter Cook button. That is the Cook the button. Oh, okay. That is a Peter Cook button. Okay. Well, uh, welcome, everybody, and thanks so much for uh, covering our mission in Afghanistan. It's a pleasure to be with you here today. Before I get started, though, I want to say uh, today's special also because I understand it's the last day for Jim Miklashevsky. Is that right? And, uh, pretty much. Pretty much? Okay. <laughs> yeah, well, it, to the extent he'll ever really uh, leave. But uh, I just wanted to pass on my congratulations to him and thanks for his long service here. And I, I remember back in 2003 when I was a lieutenant colonel running into uh, Mick in the hallway. And uh, at that time, we had a, uh, a commander in uh, Army Central who was named Miklashek. And we all thought he had the inside scoop because they were related. But it wasn't. It was because uh, Mick was such a, uh, such a professional and he's just such a good person. So please give him my best and uh, congratulations on his great career. So it's been great to work with him. So again, thanks for covering our mission in Afghanistan. It's great to talk with you today. I thought in my opening comments I'd just kind of review some of the fundamentals about the mission before we get into questions. Um, as you all know, we have two missions in Afghanistan. So I'm the commander of U.S. Forces Afghanistan and also commander of Resolute Support. So in the U.S. mission, which is Operation Freedom Sentinel, we're primarily focused on counterterrorism operations. Why is this important? Well, of the 98 U.S. or U.N designated terrorist organizations around the globe, 20 of them are in the AFPAC region. This is the highest concentration of the numbers of different groups in any area in the world. And so while the numbers may be higher in some of these groups elsewhere, uh, the concentration of, of groups in this region is important. So our presence there is critical to keeping pressure on these networks so they cannot realize their international ambitions. Secondly, on the Resolute Support Mission, <laughs> it's important to remember this is a 39-nation coalition, most of whom have been with us in this uh, region for the last 10 to 15 years. And this uh, commitment to the region not only has spanned the last decade plus, but was just reaffirmed at the Warsaw Summit going forward, that this coalition will go forward. And then in the next uh, couple of weeks, we'll have the Brussels Donor Conference, where nations will recommit to uh, donor funding to Afghanistan and some of the non-security areas. So the international commitment to Afghanistan has been significant and continues to be significant going forward. The Resolute Support Mission is primarily focused on training, <coughs> advising, and assisting the Afghan security forces. And this has been particularly important as we grow them to take over this mission for themselves. And I would highlight again, I know you're very familiar with this, but from our height of 140,000 international troops, we are now down to roughly one-tenth of that. And our mission has changed from counterinsurgency to train, advise, and assist. And now we are able then to help the Afghans with their taking over the fight uh, in Afghanistan. So uh, there's some tangible progress here we can point to in terms of especially their special forces, their police special units, their air force, just to name three examples the way in which they are conducting most of their operations in an independent manner, uh, and in the case of the Special Forces, quite successfully. So shifting gears a little bit, I'm in, I've been in Afghanistan about seven months, and so just to give you an update on where we are, this roughly coincides with when the Afghans began their campaign for 2016 called Operation Shafak, which means dawn. So this campaign uh, has essentially been on plan through the end of July. And uh, it was uh, the three phases we ran to that point. Number one was the defense of Kunduz that occurred in April and May, in which the Afghans successfully defended against another Taliban attempt to take that city. They then shifted their main effort to the south, to Helmand, western Kandahar, Ruzgan, to expand their security zone in the south. Again, this was conducted successfully in the June-July time frame. And then in late July, they shifted their effort to Nangahar, to the east, to conduct counter-ISIL operations, counter-Daesh operations. These operations were very successful. They were conducted by Afghan special forces, enabled by U.S. counterterrorism forces. And these succeeded in killing the top 12 leaders of Daesh, to include their emir, Hafez Syed Khan, 
and, and uh, tritting roughly 25% of the organization uh, of their fighters and then reducing their space in Nangarhar. So then at the end of July, early August, the enemy uh, has, has attempted to take another provincial capital. And what we've seen in the last month or six weeks are attempts to take Lashkargah, Kunduz in the north, and Terran Count in Aruzgan. In every case, they've failed. But I want to flag these because the, these have been an, an important point of the campaign uh, for the Afghans. So they've been able to respond to each of these events to restore and stabilize the situation and, of course, retain the provincial capitals throughout. Uh, important point. The, um, also in this time, our counterterrorism operations have continued to be successful uh, throughout the past six months. I mentioned the killing of Hafez Syed Khan. There was also the strike against Mullah Mansour, a designated U UN terrorist uh, in, in Pakistan, and Umar Khalifa, who was the head of the TGG, the Tariki Gidar group, which perpetrated the horrendous attack on the Peshawar Army School, which killed over 130 children. Our CT forces also rescued the son of the Pakistani, former Pakistani Prime Minister, Haider Gilani, in a raid against Al Qaeda in eastern Afghanistan. So uh, the high profile attacks is another favorite technique of the Taliban, of course. And while there have been some horrendous high profile attacks this year, the numbers overall are down from last year. So about 16 this year in Kabul as compared to 23 last year. Now, a lot of this has been possible because of the decisions that President Obama has made in support of our campaign, and I want to highlight those. First was the decision to strike Mullah Mansour inside Pakistan on the 21st of May. This had a disruptive effect on the Taliban, in particular on their finances, and it took them some time to get that themselves sorted out and recover from that. Second was the authority granted in early June, which allowed me to use U.S. combat enablers in support of Afghan forces to achieve a strategic effect. So this authority is extremely important. It's enabled us to use air power in particular, but also rotary wing and uh, armed uh, ISR platforms, UA, uh, unmanned aerial vehicle platforms in support of the Afghans. And then, and then, of course, there was the President's decision on troop levels, so as we went into the Warsaw Summit. So the decision to maintain our troop levels at 8,400 enables us to conduct, continue to conduct advising to the core level, and in the case of Special Forces and other units even below the core level, going into next year. So these have all been important decisions, which then contributed to the renewed international commitment at the Warsaw Summit in early July. And just as a as an anecdote, uh, what we saw after the Warsaw Summit was an increase in the property values inside Kabul. So the, the confidence of the Afghan people, the confidence of their security forces within the government, and I think also the effect on the enemy uh, has been important of these decisions by the administration and the, the, the consequent effect of these decisions on the battlefield. So again, uh, let me uh, just sort of wrap it up there. <laughs> and say, uh, look forward to your, your questions. And again, thanks for covering our story. Uh, General, thanks for doing this. Um, a, a couple questions. One, I was wondering, I wanted to give you the opportunity, if you wanted, to make any comments on the latest peace uh, deal that the Afghans mm -hmm. have just signed, if, if, if you wanted to do that. But, and then I have a couple questions on Right. That. So uh, this is a, an agreement that's been uh, tentatively reached between the Afghan government and the uh, Hekmartyr's group, and of course, uh, uh, the, um, this is encouraging in my mind in the sense that, you know, we have a country here that has suffered from 30 years of war, and there's many belligerents, uh, who, uh, people who in the past have fought against each other. In fact, some of these belligerents are in the government together now. But this is positive in the sense that this represents a group that is residing largely outside of Afghanistan that is now uh, reaching a reconciliation agreement with the government, which will eventually involve a reintegration into Afghan society. And of course, this is the, uh, one of the most important steps we see towards an eventual resolution of the conflict in Afghanistan, that, that these groups, these belligerents, to include the Taliban, and as we know, President Ghani has done a significant outreach to the Taliban earlier this year uh, through the quadrilateral process to try and get the Taliban to come to the bargaining table. And I know that this continues to be a goal of our international policy and our desire that we encourage this kind of reconciliation and eventual reintegration. So in that, in that context, this is a very positive step. Um, 
great. Uh, just yesterday, the, the chairman talked about uh, the Afghanistan fight as being a stalemate. I'm wondering if you could say whether or not you agree with that. And he said that uh, there are more Afghan casualties than he's comfortable with. An assessment I think you have made in the past mm -hmm. when we've seen you in Afghanistan that the numbers have been high. You talked about 900, I think, in July. Has that level continued in August and into September? Can you give us an assessment of what their casualty levels have been? And what do you think the U.S. and the coalition can do to stem that part of the problem? Last year, the Afghans suffered high casualties. We talked about those previously. And then over the winter, we engaged with them in a what we call a force regeneration effort. Uh, for example, in Helmand province, we went down there with the 215th Corps, and we, folk, we did a focused effort with the Afghans where they brought in new leaders, new soldiers. We re-equipped, we retrained, and got those units back into the field. So this uh, is the model that we're using to work with the Afghans going forward this winter to help them regenerate units that have suffered high casualties. Uh, many of these casualties have been suffered by police forces, so this is uh, something we're focused on going forward is how we can help regenerate the police. Uh, this will be done in concert with our police reform efforts, so this will be extremely important. Um, I am concerned about the high casualties, but thus far I'd point out that despite the high casualties in 2015, the Afghan security forces were able to be uh, prevent the enemy from accomplishing their goals in 2016. So that while casualties are a concern and we certainly want to lower the, uh, the casualties, um, we, we also see a resilience in that the Afghan security forces have been able to continue to fight in spite of these losses. So uh, we uh, believe that with improvements in leadership and systems like supply systems and so forth and through a reduction of dependency on checkpoints that this will reduce the potential for casualties. This is where many of the casualties have been suffered and uh, small, you know, 30 to 50 man checkpoints that get overrun by a larger enemy force. So we're working with our Afghan uh, partners on that, on how to adjust their tactics and their systems to lower their casualties. So that's extremely important. This was one of the factors I mentioned before when we talked about uh, concerns is uh, the, uh, the casualties, the convergence of enemy units, the role of external actors, and the uh, government stability uh, as being critical too as well. So we watch these factors closely, uh, and I think we have a good plan in place with the Afghans to address the casualty issue going forward. Uh, not, is 900 a stable number and a stalemate issue? Okay. on, on the. Uh, so the characterization of the conflict, so I'd, let me uh, talk about this in a, in a couple of terms. I, I think we, you know, another way to think about stalemate is you've reached some sort of equilibrium. And so what, what is the equilibrium? So as you heard yesterday from the SECDEF and the, and the chairman, we believe the Afghans control or heavily influence 68 to 70 percent of the population. We believe the enemy control or influence about 10 percent of the population. And then the balance, you know, roughly a quarter, is in play, is contested. So the fact that it's contested doesn't mean it's controlled by, by either side, but, it, but it's indeed contested. So this um, stalemate that the chairman referred to yesterday is a stalemate in which the government's controlling 70 percent of the population and the enemy is controlling 10 percent of the population. And then they're fighting over the balance. And so this is a positive in the sense of the majority of the population is under control of the government forces, and this is primarily the population centers and, and so on. And then the enemy is primarily in more rural areas that have less impact on, on the future of the country. So we clearly want to help the Afghans uh, next year and beyond to, in, to gradually increase the amount of control they exercise over the population as we also help them become more self-sustaining. So. So yes, it's something we're concerned about, uh, but it is something that we're addressing with the Afghans and uh, hoping to help them uh, move forward next year and increase the amount of control they have. Um, thank you. Uh, firstly, do you have any more details on this strike that took place earlier in the week that seems to have killed about eight Afghan police uh, soldiers? This strike was in Tarrant County. It was a strike done at the request of our Afghan partners. It's under investigation by them. Uh, we work closely with them in the identification of the target and the approval of the strike. I don't want to get in front of the Afghan investigation, uh, but these individuals uh, who were struck, there's some question about uh, uh, who, who they were and where, where their uh, 
th their target was clearly an Afghan security post. So they were uh, attacking an Afghan security post who then requested uh, our support in self-defense. And so th this is, these are generally what we know about the strike thus far, and I think there'll be more coming out as the Afghan investigation is complete. Um, second question, you talked about the Afghan forces being able to repel attacks um, mm -hmm. in some of the provincial centers. Are you concerned that the Taliban and other insurgent groups are able to make it that far that they're able to challenge provincial capitals? And is this sort of sustainable where the Afghan security forces have to keep on repelling them? I mean, how long can that continue for? Yeah, when, when I say repel, let me provide a little more detail for you. So what in the case, let's take uh, Kunduz in April and May. So what this, uh, it, it was not a case of the Afghans were dug in trenches around the city they were conducting offensive operations in the surrounding districts. So in the case of Kunduz in April and May, they conducted operations in the Archie district uh, to the northeast, for example. Uh, they conducted uh, operations to the west uh, and, and to, the, to the northwest. So they, the, the way in which the Afghan forces defended Kunduz was to conduct offensive clearing operations into the areas around the city. To, likewise, in Helmand, they did the same thing with offensive clearing operations to go into Marja, to into the southern part of Sangin District, uh, and elsewhere in Helmand, to expand the security around the city. And then what's happened when the enemy's attacked is the technique that they use is to attack uh, specific uh, checkpoints, typically along highways. And then what we see is a, an effective use of information ops and psyops, psychological operations, by the enemy against these checkpoints in which they will, they might overrun a checkpoint and then call the next checkpoint and tell them if you leave, we'll leave you alone. And so this has, the, these checkpoints have been vulnerable to this because of poor leadership at the lowest levels. And this is, when I say poor leadership, I mean by the Afghan security forces, where soldiers are not properly supplied, they don't have enough ammo, they're not you know, kept well informed or well led, and so they become more vulnerable to these style of attacks. And then of course the way they're distributed, as I mentioned before, in small packages uh, makes them more vulnerable to this as well. So this is something we've been working closely with our Afghan partners on, is so the, the, the way in which they array their forces makes them susceptible to these kinds of attacks. There's a political and social reason though for why they array their forces that way, because the Afghan population, while there are a number of population centers, they generally are distributed more, more widely than you see in other countries. So these checkpoints are usually done at the request of a local community that wants to feel more secure by having a ring of checkpoints around their community. So this is the tension we have in working with our Afghan partners. Uh, so these police and isolated checkpoints are the ones that are most vulnerable. We have to, to work then with governance, and, you know, with the governors and the provincial leaders to, to reach out to the people and deal with this. So it's really more than strictly a military situation. There's social and uh, political aspects to it as well. Then when something happens, when a checkpoint is overrun, quite often local leaders, in order to attract attention to their area, will call the media in many cases and relay, hey, the, the, you know, the community's being overrun, the city's being overrun. This results in what, I, what I'd characterize as exaggerated reports about how dire the security situation is, which then the government has to respond to, and then they typically stabilize the situation. So this pattern I just described is what we've seen in Helmand around Lashkar Gah, we've seen in Kunduz around Kunduz City, and we saw most recently in Tarankout. And so we're working closely with our Afghan partners on this, on how they can help better secure these areas, how they can react quickly, how they can reassure the population, how they communicate their message more effectively. Last question, sorry. Have you? We've got a lot of people with our questions, so please. David? When these uh, yes, David. attacks on uh, provincial capitals are repelled, are they repelled with the help of uh, American airstrikes and American special forces as, mm -hmm. as advisors at the unit level? Yes, David. The, uh, what, we, what we typically see is the, the uh, Afghans rely on their special forces to, for reinforcement on offensive operations. The, the special forces are doing most of the offensive operations around the country. And when I refer to the special forces, I'm talking about 17,000 uh, special forces, which include uh, Katehas, which is their high-end uh, 
counterterrorist unit, the commandos, uh, who are a significant portion of this, and the special police units. So these, these units are advised by Americans, uh, and, and in the case of the police units, by our NATO uh, special forces partners. And so when these units go in to action, say a commando CANDAC, they, they uh, 20 percent of the time, 10, 10 to 20 percent of the time, will have American advisors with them. And then these advisors can employ combat enablers. So uh, to, to, to uh, describe this for you, 80 percent of the special forces operations they do independently. About 10 percent are enabled, meaning we would use our intelligence platforms and air support, uh, for example, but no one on the ground. And then finally, the 10 percent would be where they're actually advised, where people are out there in, in, in the field with them. So. They, they may not have advisors on the ground, but they may have the benefit of uh, our intelligence resources, and they may have the benefit of air support. So are, they, are the Afghans capable of defending their provincial capitals on their own? Yeah, I, I think so. I think what we've seen is uh, the, the commandos, in some cases, are sent without U.S. support to stabilize the situation. Uh, and then in the case of uh, Lashkar Gah, for example, the governor, Governor Hyatt, who's a very effective governor, uh, has mobilized uh, the, the shuras and the local population. He's worked closely with his security counterparts, so they have defensive forces inside the city and outside and along the routes of Lashkar Gah. Uh, they've done a sort of social outreach as well as a security outreach to help stabilize the situation. So the answer, I think, is yes. Now, do, do we, we do use our enablers in support of them if we get in a uh, situation where, where that's appropriate. Courtney? Just one quick clarification. You keep talking about combat enablers. You mean air, from the air, right? You're not talking about enablers on the ground. Right? Okay, so the, the authority I'm granted by President Obama for combat enablers would include air support, so that would be you know the F-16s that we have. It would include rotary wing, so Apache helicopters. It could include our unmanned aerial vehicles, that uh, would provide in either intelligence or in some cases they can provide fire support. And then we also have advisors that can be on the ground with them. And that, but these advisors, when they go on the ground, are not, uh, they, they accompany, but they are to remain. Uh, for example, if, they're, if the group is closing on an objective, they're to remain at the last covered and concealed position prior to the objective. This doesn't mean, though, that they won't get in dangerous situations because you know, battlefields are very fluid. They may find themselves uh, sometimes, uh, you know, in, in a uh, in a situation where they're in direct contact with the enemy. And then just one quick one on ISIS. You, you mentioned the 12 leaders are killed and 25 percent of the fighters are gone. What? So what's the estimate of how much how many ISIS are in Afghanistan? Are they primarily in Nangarhar and are they still presenting the same threat to the government and to U.S. forces there as they were six months ago? Or? They, they are primarily in Nangarhar. We estimate their numbers are. 1,200 to 1,300 fighters. They're, they're primarily uh, Pakistani Pashtun from the Oryxai agency, uh, and who, have, who were, were previously part of Tareki Taliban Pakistan, TTP, who then changed allegiance to ISK. They were joined by some fighters from Islamic Movement of Uzbekistan who joined them as well. They have some enclaves in Kunar province, but primarily they're in Nangar province. Their goal was to establish their caliphate, the Khorasan uh, province, uh, with Jalalabad as the capital and Nangar as their initial caliphate. Now, they've been uh, frustrated in that by us, and, and the operations in July have pushed them down into the mountains of southern Nangar, and it's primarily in three to four districts. But as you, as you know, Courtney, there was a time where they had spread out to nine to ten districts last year in 2015. So the operations this year have helped to uh, push them down. And we will continue these operations in the future. Uh, yes, Joe. Yeah, two quick questions. Uh, have you seen, to follow up on Courtney's uh, about ISIS, have you seen any evidence that foreign groups outside Afghanistan are supporting the Islamic State? And if there is any uh, clear link between the Islamic State inside in, in Nangarhar and the Haqqani network and the, the Taliban? We have seen linkages between Islamic State and the Khorasan and the, and the main Islamic State back in Syria. So we have seen those linkages. And the only linkages with the groups locally are the ones I mentioned, where we had uh, fighters change allegiance uh, from one group to another. 
Uh, as far as cooperation, uh, this is something we watch very closely, but we haven't seen any large-scale convergence with uh, Linkages between the Islamic State in Syria and in Afghanistan. Financial and leadership and strategic communications. So the, in the, in the uh, one issue of Dabiq magazine, which was the Islamic State magazine, they had an article about Islamic State Khorasan province. Uh, we've seen some financial support and then uh, leadership uh, and guidance going back and forth. And that's the question. If we talk about percentage, what's the percentage of territories that is currently under control of Taliban in Afghanistan? At 10 percent. So what we see is 10 percent of the population is under their control, but they contest another 20 percent, 20 to 25 percent. So we view 20 to 25 percent of the country as contested, meaning the government and the Taliban are fighting for control of that. The Taliban clearly control 10 percent and the government controls roughly 65 to, to 70 percent. So these are rough percentages. Gordon? Uh, General, um, quick question on the uh, drawdown. Can you give us a, a quick uh, update on where the numbers are for U.S. forces in Afghanistan? Um, your kind of current assessment of what uh, capabilities you're losing uh, with that. Mm -hmm. I know some of it's kind of administrative, but also if uh, a new commander in chief is going to come in in January and want to make changes to those numbers, i.e. go up, what uh, structure are you losing potentially that would make it hard to undo these cuts? Well, we're, we're currently at 9,800 uh, U.S. forces uh, in the country. As we, and we're going to stay at, we're at that now, we'll continue at that until the end of the year. And then as we rotate units in and out, which we'll do between now and the end of the year, we'll come in uh, to that new configuration. One, one, of the, uh, one of the ways which we'll uh, address that is with over-the-horizon capabilities, as you've heard me talk about before. So some of the resources uh, would be available if required to come in from the, from the Gulf region if that were necessary. Uh, so uh, we also uh, then have looked at re realigning our forces and how they're arrayed. So with, with the, what you'll see as we transition from 9,800 to 8,400 is a, uh, an actual expansion of our um, advisory effort, so uh, focus on advising. So the advising would be, uh, right now you'll see a similar footprint occur in all four of the cores in the east and the south. So as you know, the U.S. is responsible for the four cores in the east and the south, the Germans for the core in the north, and the Italians for the core in the west as framework nations uh, with allies supporting all those efforts. Uh, and then the Turks have the, the capital area. So the four cores in the east and the, and the south then, we will, as we rotate units in, we're going to rearrange our advisory structure so we can cover down on all those cores. And then we have support from allies uh, in the south and the east to help us with some of the key functions like force protection. Uh, and then we have uh, uh, some capabilities. I'd rather not get into the specifics of which capabilities we're, we're putting over the horizon um, for uh, operational security reasons, but this is what's enabling us to, to, to restructure. Where are you? Go ahead. That's fine. Sure. Um, okay. General Nicholson, could you go back over some of what you were talking about, ISIS, and in two cases you seem to be mentioning there's foreign outside influences, so I just want to understand that better. Mm -hmm. You said, I believe you said you're seeing Uzbek fighters move in. If I understood you correctly, so number one, uh, where else from are you seeing foreign fighters come back into Afghanistan and either affiliate with ISIS or Al Qaeda? And on the issue of getting support, leadership, you said, from uh, the Islamic State in Syria, can you expand on that a little bit? Are you actually seeing people move in from Syria? Do you have? sort of proven lines of communication that you're seeing, electronic communication, what, what are you really talking about here? So uh, in answer to the first part of your question, Barbara, the, the Islamic movement of Uzbekistan was more prominent early in ISK's emergence. Their role, I think, is somewhat declined a little bit, but there, there's still some that are present. But what you had early on was uh, Safa uh, Hayek Khan, the, the leader of ISK initially formally applied to, to, the, to ISIL for uh, membership as a 
franchise, if you will, of IS and called Islamic State Khorasan. And there's a formal application process that these that these uh, satellite organizations go through. And I believe the number's around eight of them now. And they and they have to meet certain criteria. So he brought with him, uh, Hafez Sayyid Khan was the leader of the TTP in Oryxai Agency of Pakistan. So he and his fighters and mass formed the initial nucleus of Islamic State, uh, Khorasan. And then they attracted in other fighters, and, and so IMU would be the other group of foreigners, if you will. And then, and then part of this was they did this through higher pay. So some, some of this was, you know, uh, allegiance to a particular leader as he moved over. Some of it, uh, in terms of the other fighters that they've, that they've attracted, has been through higher pay than the Taliban are paid. So there was a mixture of reasons for why people joined ISK. And then over the last year, their numbers have been attrited heavily. So some of the appeal of this, you know, fight, fighting for money has worn off. Uh, they do have effective uh, information operations, if you want, an effective advertising campaign to attract fighters. So this is th this has continued to be part of their appeal. So um, what we've seen is uh, then, as far as foreigners, and it's really th those two primary groups. With respect to external leadership, so one, they applied for membership, so there was a dialogue that occurred and an approval and an acceptance and then a publicizing of their effort through debate. Um, there's been money that, that, that's been sent. And Are you talking about mainstream ISIS in Syria now? Yeah, money from the parent organization to the satellite organization. Now, now again, this I, I don't want to get into details and so forth, but there has been f uh, financial support uh, and uh, when, for example, when we killed their emir and there was a leadership succession process that occurred and there was consultation that occurred with the parent organization uh, over who the next leader would be and was that person acceptable to the parent organization and so forth. So there is a degree of uh, command and control provided from the parent organization to the satellite. Have you seen anybody move in, for, have you seen any fighters move in from Syria? No. Very quickly, may I also ask you about the Haqqani network? Um, your current assessment about the Haqqanis at the moment, I, th I think the Afghans are holding a major fa or significant family member of the Haqqanis. Anas right Haqqani is, right. is in Afghan custody. He's been sentenced to death, and his death sentence is going through the appeals process right now. Is there a sense that if the Afghans commute that, I know this may be very difficult to answer publicly, that you might have some success with getting some of the American hostages back and your assessment of the strength of the Haqqani network at this point. So on the, the, uh, the trial and the subsequent appeal process is entirely in control of the Afghan government, so that's, that's up to them how this, how this plays out. Uh, this uh, this tri the trial and uh, appeals process kind of wrapped up and the appeals process just began. So I would expect this to continue into 2017 because of the appeals process. Um, as far as the strength of the Haqqanis, we, uh, as you know, the Secretary of Defense in August, uh, in his response to Congress uh, as a result of the National Defense Act and Authorization Act of 2015, he was required to respond to Congress on whether there was adequate pressure being placed on the Haqqanis by, by the uh, Pakistan government. Uh, and he said he was unable to, to certify that there was that there was sufficient pressure being placed on them to justify additional uh, coalition support support funds to the Pakistanis. Kind of a lengthy explanation, but it was his way of saying that there's not adequate pressure being put on the Haqqanis. And I concur uh, and uh, with the secretary's assessment on that uh, that we that. Uh, the Haqqanis operationally have been able to continue to conduct operations inside Afghanistan. They, they constitute the primary threat to Americans, to coalition members, and to Afghans, especially in and around Kabul. Is there more you can do? Uh, is, is there more? Is there more U.S. forces can oh, do? Is there more so, so as part of our, the authorities I've been granted by President Obama enable us to uh, take any uh, measures necessary to defend against the Haqqani threat. So we have authorities in terms of force protection so we can act against them when we identify them. We, we track their actions very closely, especially as relates to the Kabul threat streams. Uh, and so we, you know, I have the authorities I need to, uh, to defend us against that threat. We have time probably for two more, Lucas.
General, how many senior al-Qaeda leaders remain in eastern Afghanistan, and are there any restrictions on striking them? No, al-Qaeda uh, remains at the top of our list, uh, along with Islamic State. As, uh, and I mentioned these 20 terrorist organizations, those two are at the top. And we continue to uh, hunt them uh, every day. And so there are senior leaders. As far as the numbers, I really don't want to get into uh, uh, matters that, that would affect future operations. But we, we have seen al-Qaeda, for example, last year in October of 2015. As you know, there was a, an operation conducted down in the Shorebok district of Kandahar where there was al-Qaeda and an al-Qaeda Indian subcontinent were, were present in that, in that uh, locale, in that training base that was destroyed. We continue to, to go after these, uh, this uh, network. The raid in which we rescued Haider Gilani, the son of the former Pakistani prime minister, that was, was against an al-Qaeda target. And so al-Qaeda was holding that individual hostage. Uh, we, we see them in the east, uh, stretching from, uh, you know, the Zabal, Paktika, Ghazni area in the southeast, and then up in the uh, areas to the northeast, which you're, you're familiar with, um, Kunar, Nuristan, Nangahar, this very mountainous area, which, which lends itself to uh, the sanctuary. Are there any restrictions in going after these leaders? Your predecessor, when he came to the Pentagon, told reporters he had some challenges working with the White House. So I was wondering if you're experiencing anything similar. No challenges. Thomas? Hey, sir. I uh, just want to clarify the, uh, the enabler part of the equation of your new, uh, your new authorities. That's conventional U.S. troops going out with conventional Afghan troops. Correct, as far as, you know, like a tactical air control party, JTACs, et cetera. They, they go in an advisory role. They're not, they're not accompanying them to conduct close combat. But, but they are there, for example, a Special Forces ODA, you know, an Operational Detachment Alpha, with its 12 members, would go out with a commando Kandak. And then that ODA, as you know, would have the capabilities to call in air support or provide, you know, terminal guidance for, uh, you know, bombs or... Uh, you armed, armed ISR or anything of that nature. But that ODA could be 10th Mountain guys as well, correct? Uh, no, no primarily. With, with, with the special forces, it's, uh, it's, special, it's our special unit. So it's primarily special forces. So uh, as far as what we have in terms of conventional advisors would be in what we call expeditionary advising packages. And these are primarily focused at the headquarters level. So at the brigade or corps level. So what we might do, as we did recently in the instance of Terrancout, is deploy a package up to Terrancout with advisors for the 205th Corps and the 4th Brigade of the 205th. But they weren't actually going out on operations. They were at the headquarters advising them on how to utilize these enablers. And then the enablers we used in that case, in that case included you know, close air support from F-16s, rotary wing support from Apache helicopters, and armed uh, UAVs to, to provide direct support on the ground. And then just the last, last part, you mentioned this kind of breakdown at checkpoints and you were talking about poor leadership and how mm -hmm. you know, maybe these guys didn't have equipment and ammo and right. just, you know, we're two weeks away from the 15th anniversary of this whole thing mm -hmm. and kind of wondering how you can have Afghan security forces that are, you know, we've pumped X amount of millions or billions of dollars into this and how right. you can get to that point. So when I first served in Afghanistan as a colonel 10 years ago, uh, we had about, you know, I had, I had one brigade in Afghanistan, and at that time we had 15 brigades in Iraq, okay? And we had at that time, this was in 2006, about 25,000 to 30,000 U.S. troops and about as many Afghan security forces. So the police were untrained, and the Army had only 20, you know, 25 to 35,000 troops. So then, as you know, we surged up in, uh, in 2009 and 10, where we, we raised our uh, presence to 140,000 troops in order to grow the Afghan army. Uh, and so we, uh, we now have been able, through that huge investment that we've made, to draw down our numbers to one-tenth of what they once were, and in the meantime, grow the Afghan security forces to over 300,000. Now, the, the analogy is, uh, is the old, you know, building an aircraft while in flight. These guys have been fighting the entire time. And so we're fighting as we're trying to build the Army. So they're being, the units are being built, the leaders are being trained, they're going directly into combat, a certain percentage of them are becoming casualties, and then we're starting all over again. So 
When I think of Western armies and the decades and centuries it's taken to build the professional Western armies that we have today, and given that we started, you know, 10 years ago for generous, but we really started in 2009 when President Obama decided on a comprehensive counterinsurgency strategy and a significant investment. It, it's only been seven, seven years. And so in relative terms, this is a short amount of time for, for an army that's, that's fighting every day. So as a professional soldier, would I, would I like to see faster progress? Of course. And we're going to work very hard, and we continue to work very hard with them on this. But I also see progress in the sense that we've drastically reduced our presence. And, and they, they are willing and able to fight. They take casualties, and they keep going back into the fight. And this is, uh, this is something money can't buy, is their willingness to take the fight to the enemy. And so one of the things that I'm most impressed with about the Afghans is this uh, desire to fight for their country. They view it as a matter of personal honor that they are the ones defending their country, not us. And they deeply appreciate everything we're doing with them. They know they have things to work on, but they are very committed to, to uh, winning this war on their own. What is the average percentage of casualties? I'm sorry? The average percentage of casualties for the Afghan units? I'd have to get back to you on, on that. I mean, it really varies. The police suffer higher casualties than the Army. I think this is a reflection of training and professionalism, and, and the, the reform efforts in the MOD have been – have had longer to take hold than, than the MOI. We've got more work to do in the MOI. General Nixon, I promise to keep you on schedule. Thank you, sir, for your, your engagement, and thank you also, sir, for your, your team as well in Afghanistan engaging. Thanks a lot, Peter. And again, th thanks to all of you for your uh, for covering our story. And look forward to seeing many of you in theater. Bye.